You can go ahead and turn over to Galatians 3.23. I've got that up on the slides here, I think. So we'll just go, we're going to go ahead and just start off by reading this together. Um, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. He's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive Adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Father, I ask that you would speak this morning. We invite your spirit and we yield to your spirit because this is his word to you to wield in our lives, to cut, cut apart our soul and our spirit so that we would be changed into the likeness of Christ. I ask that you would teach us to lean into our adoption as sons, um, as your children being seated with Christ. So whatever it is you want to say this morning, please say it. Let my words fade away and let yours remain. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I really enjoy mystery stories. Um, I, I like mystery movies probably more than, than reading them. Um, but mysteries are just a lot of fun to go through, especially the first time, because you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so right along with whoever that master detective is, you're discovering the clues and you're trying to figure out how they fit together. But even afterwards, it's still fun once you've already seen the solution to go back over it again. You, you know, you've, you've seen how it solves, but you go back over it again and you're like, oh, I get it now, right? I get how that fits together now. So mysteries are just a lot of fun. I love those puzzles. Paul here is honing in on an aspect of God's promise that is a little bit mysterious, that is a bit of a mystery for us, and at first would leave us wondering how the pieces could possibly fit together. But to see that mystery, we actually need to step back two weeks into our message in Galatians 3, 15 through 22. So if you remember two weeks ago, we spoke about how, and what we saw in there was that Paul argues for the law not being the fulfillment of the promise. He says it can't possibly be the fulfillment of the promise that was given to Abraham. Because if it is, if it is the way that God is going to give life and righteousness, the blessings of the promise, then God changes the terms on his people. He switches out a gift for earning. And that would, that would question the integrity of God. So he says that's not what happens. And that's what we looked at two weeks ago. And as we looked at Paul's argument, I kind of blew past two points. And so I want to go back and look at those because they reveal this sort of how does this fit together kind of struggle. Verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, to your offspring. That's not a collective noun for grammar nerds out there. Paul belabors the point that the promise of Abraham was given to a single offspring, not plural. He's like, you need to get this. It wasn't given to all the offsprings of Abraham, just to one. So the promise, blessing of life and righteousness, is promised to Abraham and to Christ. 
And then Paul sort of drops this line of th- thinking for a few verses, th- this nitpicking at singular versus plural, and he picks it up again in verse 19 and 20. So reading there, why then the law? Well, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring, singular, should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, plural. But God is one, singular. This is super exciting, right? Singular versus plural. <laughs> no, it, this, is, this is sort of like a classic, these two verses here, 19 and 20, classic example of a kind of a confusing text that one commentator will say one thing, a different one will say something else, and somebody else over here says something altogether different. And everybody just kind of like, what do they mean by intermediaries imply more than one? So instead of digging deep into that and making a stance on it, what I want to do is paint with broad brushstrokes to see Paul's overarching logic. I draw our attention to that singular versus plural discussion that he starts in verse 16. Paul really wants us to see that the law, as it interacts with God's people, demands more than just one recipient. The law demands us all to engage with it individually as a group, so there are a plural amount of recipients of the law. All of Israel receives the law. So it can't be what was promised to the single offspring because it just doesn't fit the pattern. The law is for many. The promise is for one. In fact, that, in fact, that's exactly what Paul is saying there where he says the law is for the many who are actually waiting for the promise which is given to the one. And this is where it kind of becomes a little bit mysterious. Because how can the blessing of righteousness and life be given to a single offspring, but at the same time be genuinely offered to the Galatian church? Because that's implied in this whole discussion, that the Galatian church wants the life and righteousness of the promise. They, they want the blessing that was only given to one. But the Galatian church is going to have the same problem that the whole nation of Israel had at Mount Sinai. There are a whole bunch of people. They can't possibly be the single one Christ, the single one recipient, the one promised those blessings. So how is this going to work? And honestly, just to make things even a little bit more murky and mysterious, Paul goes and quotes a different part of the original promise to Abraham in Galatians 3.8. And there he says, In you, Abraham, shall all the nations, plural, be blessed. So in Galatians 3.8, it sounds like the blessing is for the world. And then in Galatians 3.16, it sounds like only Christ receives the promise. How is this going to fit together? Well, everybody's got to try to find a solution, so the Judaizers have their version of a solution, and by now you're going to be familiar that Paul completely rejects it. The law does not solve this problem. The law is the wrong clue. Um, it's like the antithesis of a Sunday school answer. If you're in Sunday school and you raise your hand and, the, and you, to answer a question, you, you know what to say, right? What do you say? Jesus. If you raise your hand and you say, the law, you're going to be wrong. And same thing in all of Galatians. If you raise your hand and you think the answer to fitting this together, how does the single promise come to a plural people? If you think the answer is the law, you're wrong. We don't all individually earn the blessings of this promise. As a whole group of people, we don't earn the blessings of this promise. It just doesn't fit. The recipients are wrong. The effect of creating a people that's earning righteousness and life, that's wrong. And even the involvement of intermediaries like the angels and Moses, that's all wrong because either as intermediaries, they're an objective third party that's disconnected from the promise. So Moses then doesn't get the promise of life and righteousness or they're grouped together with the people who are giving the law, which means Moses along with God. But no, God is one, Paul says. So how are we going to solve this? Well, the Sunday school answer is Jesus, that's the solution. Let's how, see how he does that. Read with me verse 26 now. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. 
For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. See, the blessing of life and righteousness is given to Christ, it's given to Jesus, and then what Christ does with it is he turns around and he offers his own life, his own righteousness to the world and becomes a blessing of life and righteousness to the world. And so just as in the beginning, this is all received by Abraham at, by faith, now we engage with the blessing, the fulfillment of the blessing, the life and righteousness of Christ we engage with it by faith, receiving a gift, not by earning it, not by working for it. It's all consistent. And, and think about the way that Jesus offers this, the way Paul talks about it. In verse 29, he says, if you, and that's a, a plural pronoun, by the way, so if, if you all, plural, are Christ's, then you all, plural, are Abraham's single offspring. And how does that work? How could we be referred to both in plural and singular terms when collective nouns aren't on the table? Well, remember, Paul has already defined who Abraham's offspring is. He said that right off the bat. He said Abraham's offspring is Christ. What Paul is getting at is he's saying, we who have faith in Jesus have been united to Jesus so when Jesus receives the promised blessings of life and righteousness, we're united to him and we receive those same blessings. We get Jesus' life. We get Jesus' righteousness. The blessing, of, the blessing that was promised to Abraham is not law observance. It's not following rules. It's not doing a bunch of the right things in order to gain God's life forever in the promised land. It's being connected and united to the Son of God. That's the blessing that Abraham had no clue what he was waiting for. The life and righteousness was being united to the third member of the Trinity. So we don't receive this promise directly as a bunch of individuals, as a whole group, plurally getting life and righteousness all kind of on our own merit. No, we receive it connected to Jesus. We receive it. It's, it's consistent. It's still single given to him and then spread to us from him. But it's so much better than what we expected. It's, it's Jesus' own sonship that he offers to us. Because where does Paul go with this? He goes straight into adoption. He starts talking about how we have been made sons of God, children of God. Why is that? Because we have been connected to Jesus. And Jesus is the son of God. Our adoption is the blessing of life and righteousness that Abraham was waiting for. This allows us to be heirs right alongside, maybe better put, inside of Christ. So it doesn't matter, Paul says, if personally I approach God as a Jew or as a Greek because that's not how I gain the blessing of promise. It doesn't matter if I'm circumcised or I'm uncircumcised. Because God doesn't look at me and say, you will receive the promise based off of who you are. He looks at me and says, you will receive the promise based off of your connection to Jesus. You can be a man or a woman. You can be, have a, be a person with power or you can be a person who's been oppressed all your life. All of it doesn't matter. It only matters being connected, united to Jesus. So here's why this matters if it doesn't already kind of seems sort of plain. The Jewish law, Paul says, created a people that was really no better off than slaves. Did, they, did Israel have the promises? Yes, they did. They, they had been given to it and they'd been holding on to it, treasuring it, contemplating these promises that Abraham received. The law in some ways is like a, a digging in and understanding more fully what those promises really were. So yeah, Israel had that. But could she access them? Could she access the life and righteousness? If you think through the story of Israel, do they seem characterized by a people of righteousness? Not really. 
If you think through the story of Israel, do they seem characterized by a people full of life? And again, not really. They have to deal with exile because of their unrighteousness. They have to be deal with judgment from God because of their unrighteousness. The law locked them up waiting for the promise to be given to the singular Christ. They were longing for that. And so Paul says, he uses this metaphor, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So what I mean is that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he's the owner of everything, he's under a guardian and manager until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So this makes me think back to when I was a kid. And I think about how growing up, I would have to go to school every weekday, right? I didn't have a choice in the matter. I just had to go. And on the weekends, when I'm hanging out with my friend Trevor, I'm talking to him and we're thinking about what life's going to be like when we're adults. I'm like, well, it's obvious. We're going to have all this freedom, so I'm going to get a car. I'm going to drive down. I'm going to buy a house across the street from you, and we're just going to hang out all the time. Because adulthood is associated with freedom. Being a child is associated with other people telling me where to go, what to do, when to do it. And even though I might get the idea as a child that, yeah, one day, by the way, that never really materialized, unfortunately. Maybe it will one day. Who knows? We'll, we'll see. But regardless, as a, as a child, we're looking forward to the freedom of being adults, not knowing all the responsibilities that go along with it. But our parents who are faithful to us and who love us dearly say, I want to put somebody over you who is going to help you grow into a responsible adult to manage that freedom, to help you understand the value of that freedom. And so what do we do? We, as adults, put our kids in school in whatever form that looks like. And so then there's a teacher or a guardian in place over those kids, helping them learn how to become adults, how to be responsible as adults. And the teachers are responsible. They have the authority. So they say when we have to study, and they say when we can get up from studying. They say when it's time to eat and when we're done eating. And they say when it's time to go outside and when it's time to come back in. And children, in that sense, from this perspective, are in no better position than people who are owned by other people. They don't have access to the freedom of adulthood. And to take it one step further, we as kids might know that our parents are longing to one day hand off a heritage to us, which is a lot more than maybe just fiscal resources. Our parents, we, we might get the idea that our parents sort of, they, they want to give us their name to bring into the next generation. They want to give us their system of morality so that we can live in what a, looks like a righteous way to them. They, they want to share that with us. They want us to have their understanding of social responsibility so that we'll be good, socially responsible adults in the next generation. And we get the idea that our parents are wanting to pass this on to us, but that's all locked up in the distant future while we watch a clock tick waiting for summer. And that's what, that's what Paul's talking about. He's like, this is what the law is. The law is a guardian and a teacher that has an incredibly important part of your life, but only for a time. How silly would it be to want to go back to kindergarten as an adult? That's not where, that's, that's so incomplete in terms of what life is. There's so much con you're, you're so controlled in that stage of life. The Galatians are being told, come back to kindergarten and live under the law. And what Paul says to them is, there's a mystery here that we have grown into adulthood in God's economy by faith. We have been freed from the elementary principles of the world, meaning we are no longer told over and over again that the righteous requirements of God are way up here and we are down here. We are no longer told anymore that we are inadequate right on a righteous level, on a moral level before God. That's a base, simple, elementary principle of the world. 
Paul talks about it in Romans 1. He says, you can go anywhere in the world and the natural divine revelation of God is going to say those same things. The law just makes it crystal clear. We're not in bondage to that anymore because we have been freed as we grew up into Christ by faith. And so Christ's righteousness, Christ's role of being the Son of God has been given to us. And he looks at me now, and he looks at you now, and he doesn't see a whole bunch of people earning a place before him, a whole bunch of kindergartners trying to be good. What he sees is his son, who he describes as beloved. This is my loved son, who he describes as with whom I am well pleased. He looks at you, and when he sees Jesus, he sees you and says, you are loved. I am well pleased with you. This is the life and the righteousness that Jesus receives singularly and gives to us as a blessing. Adoption. I was reading, uh, I think it's Dave, David Platt was quoting J.I. Packer. And J.I. Packer said that justification, being made right with God, having our sins taken away from us and instead being given innocence, being, being right with God, is the most fundamental, primary, important blessing of the gospel for us. We need it desperately. We need to be made right with God. But it is not the greatest blessing if you can make a distinguishing piece here, it's the most necessary for us, for us to be made right with God, but it is by no means the greatest blessing that the gospel has to offer us. The greatest blessing that the gospel has to offer us, Packer says, is to be made united to Jesus, adopted as children of God, to be cherished and loved. I went way away from my text, so I don't know where I am. We don't just receive life. You know, he's promised life and righteousness, but we don't just receive a life and a level of righteousness. No, we get Jesus' life. We get Jesus' righteousness. And so it's like in The Prince and the Pauper, that story, where the prince... Um, swap spots with the pauper, and the pauper gets to receive all of the life and extravagance of the prince. And that's what's happened to us. The life and the righteousness we've received is that cherished relationship that Jesus had with his father. And so we have a spirit in us now who cries out and he speaks to our minds, he, he calls to our hearts, and he tr tries to reorient the way we think and live in this life so that we agree and say, Abba, Father, Daddy, close, intimate Father. It's given to us. That's what we get to walk in. What a wonderful promise and a wonderful inheritance. So what's our reaction to the solution to the mystery? How does the single and the plural come together? It comes together in Christ as we are united to him in a way that God no longer separates us and says, says like, you over here are unrighteous and my son is righteous. Now he's, he's united us together and he sees all of the righteousness of Christ in us. All of his love that he funnels on the son is given to us too. What's our reaction? Some of you are going to know who I'm talking about and others won't, and that's okay. I'm not going to name anybody here. But when our churches first came together, two different congregations merged together. We had this sharing and prayer time. And there'd be a man who'd stand up during that sharing and prayer time. And he would talk about his relationship with God and how wonderful it was. And how he'd talk about what he'd been reading in scripture that week. And every single time, it seemed like, he wouldn't be able to get through what he was saying without tearing up. Because of how deeply it touched him. And I saw that man share that with us week in and week out. And I thought to myself, I want to respond like that. I want my heart to be evoked like that by the gospel, that I tear up on the inside. And I get that there were all different levels of emotional, right? Some of us are completely like sobbing on the inside and we look like this. 
you know? And other of us, like, the, it's the smallest things and we're weeping, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That one person is not more holy than the other. But here's what I think we're called to with the Spirit speaking to us saying, you have Abba, Father, as your God. Here's what, here's what we, he wants us to do. He just wants more. He wants it, our response to be more than everything else. So if I weep over rom-coms, then he wants me to weep a little bit more over the relationship of love that he has with me. If I'm stoic, but on the inside I feel moved a little bit when I'm reading some, some good theology or when I'm, when I'm reading some clever philosophical arguments, then he wants that to be stirred more than any other book, or more than any other story. And he wants to keep moving us forward to this place where we are affected by the gospel, where we treasure it, where we're willing to eventually get to the point where like Jesus, we're willing to say, I have you, Father, and so you can send me through Gethsemane, you can send me through a cross, because I have you, your will be done. Everything else pales in relationship to the beauty of being the Son of God. And being united to him. So that's my prayer for us. That's the application. Pressing into this truth that's been given to you. This reality that you are so connected and united in love with God. That's what communion is, right? Communion is saying, Christ's body and blood given to me. United with me. I get to live his life now and his righteousness will live in me. His very spirit has been put in me. <coughs> Lean into that. Learn to appreciate and experience and wonder more at that truth and taste it. One day, off in the future, when Jesus returns, there's going to be th- the whole veil of the way we, like, this seems, this seems abstract. Like, these seems like, like great ideas, you know. All of that veil is going to go away one day. And instead, it's just going to be the reality of Jesus standing there as king and saying, you're welcome into my Father's house. You're with me. And so we're gonna, it'll be, we'll be doing great in terms of our response at that point. But he invites us now. He invites us now to treasure it. He invites us now to live out of Jesus' identity, not our own. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you that you did not make us stand before you on our own to prove ourselves before you, to prove ourselves valuable. But instead, you have sent Jesus to stand in front of us and to stand with us. And your love for him and your joy in him, your pleasure in him you've given to us. Lord, let that be the most important truth in our hearts and in the way we live and in the decisions we make. And we confess all the times that we forget that. We confess all the times that we think we have to stand alone. And we agree with you that Jesus is our righteousness, Jesus is our life. Please be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen.